First, thanks Cyril for inviting me to come here. It's a great honor um, to be here at the APFL, um, a school that I like very much, I think has a very important position in European um, academic architecture. Um, I always particularly like coming here from the ETH because it's kind of, there's a special relationship between the two. So I think that's one of the things I keep, so I'm enjoyed that I've come here again for, usually I come here for crits, but for a talk is great. So what I'm going to speak about is, um, I'm talking very much as a practitioner, um, a designer, a design teacher, but also a design practitioner or, or, or who builds things. I'm not talking as a historian or a scholar. Um, I'm talking very much from how has Saul Steinberg affected my work? Because when I was asked uh, to speak, um, to, I was very happy because Saul Steinberg is one of a collection, a very small collection of maybe five or six practitioners across different disciplines that has had a kind of profound, a profound in, in influence on how I look at the world. Um, and then as such, then uh, design and build things. That's kind of what I'm touching on today, this idea that Saul Steinberg, even though he's not an architect, supposedly, even though he doesn't make uh, propositional schemes, he has a, a way of looking which can inform us today, an, an important way to inform us today. Um, and I'm going to touch on, on, on his relationship to architecture, to drawing in general, uh, to Lina Bobardi, and then at the end I'll focus on two projects, two of our smaller projects um, at Corpa, which are small cultural projects, but I feel are somehow part of this, this thinking that I link up to um, Saul Steinberg and similar, similar work. So I'm going to read a few bits and pieces, but, but generally I'll be trying to speak um, directly about the work on the screen. Um, so let me just see where I am. <laughs> so, what, so what is it about his work that is appealing? What's, what, 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 what are the fundamental a aspects of Saul Steinberg's work? I think the thing to say is that they're about lines, which might sound slightly obvious, almost banal statement to make, but I think the lines in Saul Steinberg's work go beyond um, simply just uh, uh, drawing. Um, and I think a good way to, um, to look at it is, um, is uh, them them thematically. So first of all, we have a few, I, I've selected four drawings of Saul Steinberg that I find particularly important. One, this one dealing with the landscape, the sort of large structure that we have to inhabit and live with, and it shows the relationship between ourselves and landscape scale structures and cities. Uh, the relationship between um, uh, us and the buildings and building blocks, uh, um, city blocks we have. Uh, the idea of facade and fakeness and artifice everyday life as a being a kind of uh, a kind of stage set for life to be play, played out on. And then finally, the more intimate spaces, the kind of objects and spaces that form uh, the, the more in, intimate parts of our life. And then finally, um, this use of line as a kind of action, as a kind of uh, movement. So I'd like to show you a little bit of a film to open up this topic of what a line might be. I think after this we've had enough, we'll move on. <coughs> but if you don't know what this is, this is, the, this is The Way Things Go by, oops, it's still going. But this, this is a half an hour movie by 
official advice to Swiss artists? Um, and what's, what's fascinating about this work is that what we have is we have a kind of line, we have a kind of story unfolding, a collection of everyday things being both put together and taken apart sim simultaneously. We have a work which has the character of a line or the character of line work. We have a work about observing, collecting, assembling things from the world. We have a world, a, a work where, the, where a world, and by extension the world, it could be said, is a kind of limited model with its own endearingly deranged orders and, orders and habits. And I think this, this, this description of this work of Fish and Vice also serves to be a good description of the work of uh, Saul Steinberg himself particularly this idea of endearingly deranged ha ha habits. Um, um, and I think what connects both of these, both of these uh, ar artists is they both have a kind of critical, they throw a kind of critical eye over, over the world, world as we know it, the things it's made of, um, the kind of process it has, All, always with a sort of love, a love of what it's looking at and a kind of playfulness, but a critical eye n nevertheless. Um, and it's the parallels between these two kinds of work, this idea of, of a line being not just a drawn line, but being a story, being about observation, uh, being about almost taking a walk. You could almost say that here you have an action being taken on a walk uh, through, through a room. And for me, this, this offers, along with a couple of other practitioners that we'll look at here, uh, offer another way of, of looking at the world, which I think can inform contemporary design, contemporary architecture design in an extreme profound way. Um, there is an anthropologist called Tim Ingold, a British anthropologist um, who deals with lines, which actually the, the title of my lecture is accidentally borrowed from. Uh, he, actually, he has a, an, an essay on, on the topic and he asks, what do walking, weaving, observing, singing, storytelling, drawing and writing have in common? The answer is that they all proceed along lines of one kind or, or another. And I find this quite a beautiful idea of of a way of approaching the world, a deeply human way of um, a, 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 a approaching the world. Um, and these different forms of line that are mentioned by uh, Tim Ingold, some of them, if not all of them, also form as dis possible descriptions of Steinberg's work. Steinberg's work could be described as having the characteristics of a walk, taking a line for a walk, as Paul Klee famously told us. Uh, it definitely has the characteristic of being, uh, about being uh, observing, observing the world, the world as we find it. It for sure has the quality of being like a story, like the act of storytelling, tell which in Saul Steinberg's case is with extreme skill because with very few lines on a single page, he can tell a complete rich sto story. And then of course writing. Um, Steinberg, as I'm sure as we all know, famously described himself as a writer who draws rather than writes. And this kind of expanded notion of what the line is, I think, will allow us to critically o open up the potential of Stein Steinberg's work, but also link it up to um, um, other pra practices. Um, this is Richard Long, who also works with lines. I wanted to include him, not because I want to speak about his work, but again, again to open up this, the, both uh, the formal possibilities of the line but also the other aspects of it to be doing to it um, to to be about the world at large, observing the world and moving through it. Um, just say it was great. I came to see the show last week. Uh, I was at a, a, a crit here actually with with uh, with uh, some of the aud audience, and it was great to come and see the show because it put into relief um, some of the things. Uh, that I think about Steinberg, that I think are important about Steinberg. Um, but one thing in particular it brought, brought up were the two, should we say, the most obviously distinctive aspects of Steinberg's work. Um, firstly, the primacy of what I would call the naked line, meaning the line without materiality, without shadow, that speaks of measure and exactitude, ex exactitude of an architect's drawing. Um, and secondly, the symbolism of buildings and cities, um, or to put it in another way, the culture of the built fabric of everyday life. And these, these two points, uh, which come across very clearly in the exhibition, which is to do with the artists that were selected to be put along Ste Steinberg, um, highlight this point. And I guess 
I guess what I'm saying in this lecture is that's one way to look at Steinberg, but there is this other way, which is the line as, as a way to, to, to investigate and look at the world. Um, but, these, but these first two points, shall we say, the naked line um, and the symbolic locate him really at the heart of architectural thought and practice. So I would like to claim him as an architect because one, one of the problems of Steinberg is that he's, he's been difficult to define. Is he an artist? Is he an illustrator? Is he an architect? So I would like for the sake of uh, the, practice to, uh, the practice of architecture to say that he started a, a, as an architect and his work remained profoundly ar ar architectural, both in technique and the fact that he uses uh, the architect's primary tool, drawing. I would argue that drawing is more primary than model making or one-to-one -one because you can conduct an entire an entire project simply with drawing. You can't do that with other mediums. Also, there's a, there's a, there's a legal point. Uh, you can't actually do anything without producing drawings. It's a legal document. So, uh, so the drawing for the architect is inescapable. And, and his drawings in particular have, have this character, as I was saying, of, of, of measure and exactitude. They are clearly an architect's um, drawings. Um, so in that case, I'm, I've always been interested in seeing what is it that drawing does for architecture, um, if it is this kind of primary thing. What, what is it that, allows, that it allows arch architects to do? So I've looked over the years at what forms of um, drawing there are. I mean, there's technical drawing, there's concept drawing to describe a project, there's the thinking sketch, thinking as you go. Uh, there are theoretical drawings, which is the one I'd like to touch on a bit more here and consider Steinberg for a moment as a kind of theoretical ar architect. Um, the, the reason for that I'll, I will come back to uh, later. Um, so this, by the way, is the naked line, I would call, call it. And this is to do with the uh, symbolic, the symbolic of the everyday built. And he works very much with, 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 with these things. Again, the line. And so if we make a jump, a sudden jump, still into drawing, but very much the world of architectural theory, what's interesting is that architectural theory, um, after the invention of the Gutenberg press or, or, or the printing press, is for long periods characterized by drawing, up until I'd say even 30 years ago. In the last 30 years, architectural theory has been dominated by the word, by the written word, uh, by the writer. But architectural theory for a long time was the domain of drawing. Um, and, these, and these theories which were, were, were realized by many architects but across many countries uh, through Europe I can speak about, not, 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 not further abroad, um, uh, formed the, the intellectual core of the practice of architecture. Um, these drawings don't have legal or, or practical function. They often try to set up norms through doctrine, something you should follow or they try to establish what Kubuzi referred to as regulating lines, those, those lines required to achieve beauty. But at certain points in history, um, or certain examples, these theoretical drawings have been more of a critique or a commentary on the world as it's found. And these are usually surveys. So surveys being uh, a, 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 a very important part of, of architectural uh, theory. And I think it's slightly unusual to state that because architectural theory through drawing is usually attached to what columns should be, what the spacing should be, and it's very much uh, telling you as a practitioner what you should do. Whereas the idea of the survey is seen as a kind of just a documentation of, of, of the world, except when you make a survey of place, what you choose to draw and what you don't choose to draw actually is already a, a huge kind of statement of, of, of intent. Um, and I see Steinberg's work as a kind of survey, a kind of survey of the ev every day. Yeah? He doesn't draw from life, but I'll come back to that later. He, he actually resists drawing from life. He says that he doesn't want to draw still life. He doesn't want to draw uh, landscapes. He wants to take control of the topic and be more of a protagonist. But what he does do is he derives from e everyday life. His work is not fantasies. It's not science fiction. It's not utopias. It's derived from from the world he finds around him. I, I would imagine on walks even. I even imagine this idea of lines would permeate his whole practice. Um, so where are we? Okay. So, so now we can look just a quickly 
to speed through, through this, we're going to look at a few key points. This, this role of drawing in architectural theory. I mean, there's a big problem with drawing in, in architecture pre-Renaissance because no one exactly knows how drawings were made and if theoretical drawings were made. For instance, Vitruvius's books were free from drawings and had to be illustrated late, later. So drawing as theory, we can say, only really merges with the beginning of the modern era, if you can call the beginning of the modern era being the Renaissance. And so it's dominated at first by Italy. Um, Serlio, Palladio, a few others. Um, and the character of this work is largely quite, it's very rigorous, it's quite dry and quite ac academic, and it's to do with uh, the rigorous taxonomy um, of the elements of architecture, the, 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 the kind of compositional parts, both in elevation and plan. Um, and theories is dominated by drawings like, like these. Um, but something I think is very, for me, there's a kind of Im important break in this sort of history of European theory through drawing. And it's the work of uh, Fischer von e e Erlach, and in particular, um, his book, A Plan of Civil and Historical Architecture. Because he does two things which are quite interesting. One is that he takes a survey. So he'd spent, I think, I think something like two decades preparing the ground for a series of drawings about the most wonderful buildings in the world, the most wonderful cities in the world, as, as he saw it. And then he would draw them up. But these, but, but these drawings were, were, were not dry and academic and flat. They were spatial, narrative, in, including things like uh, uh, plants and over, 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 overgrown elements, also including uh, people. And he begins, I think, to make a kind of commentary on everyday life. He begins to make uh, uh, these drawings, these rigorous drawings, somehow um, sp uh, speculative and critical. Here's an example where he draws um, um, King Solomon's uh, temple, and it's a beautiful drawing because this, I mean, first you have the, the level of the ground, then the actual temple is built below ground level, like a, like a church in Ethiopia, but it's so large that these buildings become like little models. So this amazing game of real and un, un, unreal and begins to take, uh, it becomes a very sophisticated way to, to begin to, to talk about arch architecture. Also this, this inclusion of, of the smoke is interesting because it begins to interest the, the, introduce the idea of the domestic, it's not just um, uh, no, noble columns. Uh, this kind of huge, huge ground covered in, cr in crowds, informally forming and unforming also begins to make quite a different description of the world through arch architectural theory. And if you haven't seen this book, I would recommend immediately go and <laughs> have a look at it because it's kind of fascinating. And I think he's an important figure because I would even argue that there's a kind of before him and after him. And before him, like I was saying, there's this kind of rigorous academic uh, work. And then after him laid the ground for other people. One of them being um, Piranesi. Um, and Piranesi, along with von Erlach, are the two figures I'm picking out from architectural history of having this work, which is not propositional exactly. It's not exactly fact. It's somehow derived from the real. Um, and it's somehow a kind of um, critique on both architecture and life. And this is a, a famous drawing by Piranesi. Uh, it's kind of fascinating because he plays with the, with, with the notion of drawing. So he makes a kind of engraving on a rock, which is on a piece of paper. So I feel this is somehow related to Steinberg, even this playing with the notion of the space of the page. Um, so this idea that, that by actively pursuing drawing as, as, as your primary tool, it can free you up. Um, to use drawing not just for making miniaturized instructions for larger things that will happen in the future, but to, for the actual drawing itself to be something, right? And these, I mean, I, I will try to get to the other work. Um, this is part of his survey, this is an extensive survey of Rome, which is not entirely fact. Um, it's, it's a kind of reconstruction of a kind of Rome that he desired almost. 
And then this is one other example, just to touch on. It's by Robert Adam, and it's, um, it's a survey of Di Diocletian's uh, pal palace. And this is an interesting example um, because it very clearly makes a connection between the survey and inventions in architecture. So after this survey, um, neoclassicism in Britain emerged. It was a, as a direct result of this survey. So this idea that you can just go and look at something carefully and then give birth to design ideas I find quite useful and beautiful. So rather than immediately jump into the idea that you're going to design something and have some brilliant idea, no, you first just look very carefully at what, at, at what there is. So it, just to give some examples, there, there, there's the below, which are the, 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 the ruins as he found them, and above the, the, the reconstruction, his, how he imagined it looked. I think it's interesting that he shows both because I don't think, it, I don't think he loves the reconstruction more than the ruin. I think actually he equally loves both. So I find this kind of intriguing as well, this, this idea that unlike the earlier theoretical work, which is only about complete perfection, this kind of uh, exactitude of this ritualistic arch architecture, somehow there's a kind of embracing of, of things passing, of decaying, um, which I think is quite an important thing to embrace when looking at the world in general. Now, of course, the most famous example, just to mention, of looking at the world to gain new architectural ideas is the book by Venturi Scott Brown. And he's an, I can never, there's a third guy, I always forget his name. Do you remember his name? No, I can't remember it. There's a third guy who wrote that book. No one ever remembers. Uh, um, but this book is very much, it's very much in this tradition of the survey. It's, it's very, Scott. no, no, Scott, Scott no, no, there's Venturi Scott Brown and there's a third one. No. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everyone forgets. Uh, but what's in interesting is this book is really a survey, right? Um, and if you read the book, uh, Learning from Las Vegas, sorry, just to, um, to mention it, what they talk about is this idea is that, is that the architect can learn from everything. Um, and the architect can become completely liberated and free just by observing the landscape and the objects he finds in the landscape clearly. I find this is extremely closely connected to the other, other examples before. And this idea of survey is somehow embedded in careful looking, in drawing, in seeing the world as it is and beginning to develop ideas from there. Uh, I think even in the exhibition, it makes a mention that there is a connection between um, um, Steinberg and, uh, and Venturi Scott Brown, um, which is well known, so I won't go into here. And then a slight, a slight change of di direction. Um, one thing I was intrigued by for years, and I never really got a moment to mention it now, is the parallel between Lina Bobardi and Saul Steinberg. Both of them moved to, both of them born the same year, or more or less, well, one year apart. Uh, both of them moved to Milan, uh, one to work for Gio Ponti, um, that's in the case of Lina Bobardi, and the other to study in the case of, of Saul Steinberg. And they found themselves in, in an extremely dynamic, rich uh, Milanese architectural cult culture. One other thing they found, both being young, is that they didn't have any architectural work. So they both began to work illustrating magazines. Um, Lina, I can't remember which mag but each one began this kind of practice. And if you look at the drawings, there's a kind of parallel in style between them. And it's difficult to say exactly if one was influencing the other or not, but there seems to be a kind of culture there, a kind of shared culture. Now, I can't tell you for sure that they met each other in Milan. I would be, I'm pretty sure they are, because in later life, once Lina Bobaji had moved to Brazil, um, Saul Steinberg came to stay with her. Um, I find this a kind of a, a, a beautiful little story in the world of um, architecture history, which I'd like to expand on. But here was a good opportunity to sort of touch on that at least. So there's a, there's a stylistic concern. There, 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 there's also a kind of a content concern which links the two of them. This is another drawing by Lina Bobaji. This one I find quite similar to Saul Steinberg because one of the beautiful things about Saul Steinberg just to say from a technical point of view, is he came up with this idea of putting the, um, the horizon high up on, on the page. 
And the reason to, which is not exactly what this is, but it reminds me of it. And the reason he does that is because he buys himself extra space, you know? Like, if there's his page, if he puts his horizon there, then he only has this much space to work with. Whereas if he puts his horizon here, he can suddenly work with all this space. It's quite a clever little trick, which I was quite, was quite impressed by. And Lena's full of these little tricks as well. I mean, if you look at this one particularly, this one actually has an amazing secret um, com composition to it, which I won't go into it now, but this one does as well. But somehow it's about how can you work with the space of the page. Uh, arch arch architecturally, the page becomes a kind of site. So one of the things I was intrigued by with Lena is Lena did become an architect, and Steinberg did not. But Lena, because of the parallels between the work, offers a kind of counterfactual history almost of what if Saul Steinberg <laughs> became an architect, yeah? And I find this quite an intriguing thought. And, what, and so Lena, with her particular way of seeing, seeing the world, she moved to Brazil. Uh, she was an Italian, she moved to Brazil and became very involved with Brazilian culture and fell in love with it and, and, and all these things. But she began to, she carried on drawing and drawing this, this, this way of drawing, which was, which was before much carefuler and, and it's about being paid as well, these, these drawings, you know, it's about an illustration. But, but, the, but these drawings carried, carried on into her own private practice, personal practice as an architect, and they generated a lot of her work. And what's interesting is if you look at drawing like this, where she embraces informality, she embraces the kind of si signage, she embraces a lot of the things that would be embraced in a kind of Steinberg, Steinberg drawing. By this point, you could say there are radical differences from, from Steinberg. Uh, but them thematically, um, there are strong links still. And so this is, this is a design for room in, at the base of this tower here. This is a, a design by Lino Bobardi. And this is the Sesc Pom Pompeia. The Sesc Pompeia is a, how do you call it? It's a kind of community centre, kind of, sort of cultural and sports centre for, for local working people who aren't, who aren't particularly wealthy. And it's paid for by local businesses, ta a local tax for local business to pay for cultural and sports facilities for poorer people, basically they're the kind of employees. But this project for me is perhaps the kind of culmination of, of Lina's move away from being a modernist, not to be a postmodernist, but to be something else in, in entirely, or a kind of other modernist, which is exactly the same move that um, Steinberg made. Um, and what I find intriguing is I find the character of her drawing in this very building. I, al I even, even almost begin to find the character of drawing that particular way in this building. And I would even imagine that it's even Steinberg-like, this idea of just playing with, with lines and, uh, and making windows, which is more to do with the lines than the idea of the window, playing, playing with characters. You have something narrow, something wide, and they become like two, two aw awkward friends. Um, there seems to be lots of things that are somehow embedded in, um, in both the work of Steinberg and uh, Lina. This I find particularly beautiful as well. This, this could almost be a Steinberg drawing. If you just had a line like this and just had some clouds, it would, for me, would be Steinberg-like, this kind of reflection on, on the world. And these, these are the kind of spaces she makes on, on, on the interior. They're somehow, they're somehow bold, but they're somehow domestic. Uh, they're definitely everyday, and they're somehow um, available to everyone and en anyone. It becomes a kind of a place for a collection of stories, um, which I, I mean, just to say, I mean, uh, Steinberg's work, which I'll come back to later, I think can be described as a world in movement, precariously balanced, a game of masks and a collection of small stories. I would say that the character of Lena's spaces and buildings she made have, have those characters. Okay, so now to move a little bit on to away from the naked line and how the naked line and architectural theory and how, the, how, how lines and drawing become key to making a particular vision of the world, as realized in Lina's work. Then back onto this idea of the symbolic, sim symbolism. Um, here in, the, in this series of drawings, you can see um, Steinberg's concerns or what, what is the material of his work. So on the one hand, it's the, sim the symbolism, the kind of artifice, the kind of theatricality of every day. Um, in this drawing, you see the, 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 the kind of show-like facades of buildings. 
you see the almost choreographed um, confusion of, of the streets. You have this idea of landscapes, of streets and blocks. You have these, these kind of um, public spaces where people come together, and then you have private rooms. And what he's dealing with, I would say, are, are the primary spatial um, forms or types or whatever you want to call it that, that form the background of, of, of our lives. So, so the very material of, of his work are the things that, as architects, we have to deal with. So he has observations on furniture, on streets, and the all, man, all, all, all manner of things that I think can come back to help us in, in our work. Um, I want to make a small note just to say um, where I think Stoll Steinberg's work is coming from, because he was he's a kind of illustrator, well, he was an illustrator for a while. Um, his work was predated by Rube Goldberg, who was who was who became very well known for making endless drawings like this of uh, perpetual motion machines, but also Heath Ro Robinson, for, um, who also made these uh, perpetual motion machines, and they're both. Il illustrators from the generation of one or two generations above Steinberg. I'm not sure if he would have been aware of them. Um, there's a good chance he was, um, at least by the time he got to the States. Um, but what I find interesting in this work is that it has this idea of the primacy of the line, the kind of action, one thing leading to, uh, to another thing, a kind of examination of, of how the world works, how, how the world is a particular in um, internal l logic, which I feel his drawings are always about, like how does the world come together? Uh, uh, what are the things, these rooms, these streets, these, these blocks that actually form our er 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 everyday life? And the reason to show these is because I think it makes even stronger the connection to the work of uh, Fishley and Weiss, um, but then also uh, will come later to the British art artist Richard Wentworth. And I'd like to read this uh, this thing again to see where we are. I mean, basically, what I've been trying to do is, ex is to expand the notion of line to the walk, the story, and the observation. So it's not just about drawing, although drawing is important. But that expanded notion allows us to see more clearly um, what the themes are of Saul Steinberg um, and begin, begin to link him to this work and, and, and the work before. I think uh, what links them is again to say the thing, this world, this world in movement, precariously balanced, a game of masks, collections of small stories. Um, here's another example. So just to move on, um, where are we? Okay, I'm going to speed up. Um, so, the, so these are two sculptures, very temporary sculptures by, um, by um, Fischl and Weiss, the Swiss art artists. And, and these sculptures last for a very short amount of time. But they somehow have the quality for me of a kind of action uh, um, Steinberg drawing, a kind of sudden movement where everything's described in one go, um, but the line could easily just disappear, as this does. And then this idea of, not just this, this idea of or, or of a line being an action, or a line being um, about a collection of things about the world. There's also this idea of a line being a walk, to go back to the image from before. And I'd like to speak about this in relation to the British artist, um, Richard Wentworth, whose practice, he's a sculptor and a photographer, and produces beautiful sculptures, um, working with everyday objects. But he also has this um, photo series called Making Do and Getting By, where he basically goes for walks in London, in the area where he lives. And he, along that walk, he takes photos. And he takes photos of things, seemingly unremarkable things, which you wouldn't usually look at. But he considers, he looks them almost through the lens of theatre or as art. Um, these things which people have just done to make do and get by. So he has this, coll this, this collection started sometime in the 70s. And, and since then, uh, there have been other artists who have been taking similar photos, but really his, his, his work is perhaps one of the first clearest examples of this way of working. And he's very interested in, in shape and just uh, 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 coincidences, coincidences and rhymes, so squares and squares, also in the kinds of things that people do 
for some reason he couldn't possibly explain. He, kept, he was walking on the street one day and had seen this. He couldn't figure out why someone had done it. But he has endless photos of these. He has uh, photos of doorways full of wood, cars with, with strange paper stuck in, where someone has just done something precariously just to um, um, allow something else to happen afterwards. Again, this for me is to do with lines. You do, you do something that leads to something else, leads to something else, leads to something else. And also, his way of working, these are all photos by him, um, his way of working is based very carefully on, on observation. I would call it a kind of survey of everyday life as well, where he doesn't put the camera and looks at the horizon. He looks down here or up here. He looks at, 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 at the feet of things and the heads of things um, and never sort of focuses on that kind of middle distance, which you can get quite lost in somehow. So this work, particularly this photo series, has been very important for me personally. Um, and I was lucky enough, or Gruppe, uh, my company, um, where I have two partners, I we forgot to introduce them, uh, Christoph Junk and Boris Gusic, there are other people involved as well. Um, we were invited by him um, uh, to do a, a project in London. So I'm going to show two projects now. Um, from my o office, which are very small cultural projects, you, you, you could say. Um, and the first one is called the Black Maria, and this is a drawing of the Black Maria from underneath, which is quite difficult to un understand, but this is what's kind of intriguing about it. And what the, st what the story was is that Richard had been asked to work in King, to, to propose a project for King's Cross, because um, King's Cross was being massively redeveloped, and his, his photos are largely from around King's Cross, so he's an artist living in the area of King's Cross. King's Cross was an industrial area, a very important industrial region in, in, in London for many years, and then has been in disrepair as a kind of ruin for the last 25, 30 years. It was full of nightclubs and uh, things like this for, for a long time. Um, and this is how it started King's Cross. It was basically a huge collision of uh, uh, different rail lines to get goods in and out of um, London. So this whole area, which was completely empty for decades, um, is now being redeveloped. Um, here, here we have a, a building on the right, which is called the Granary Building, which is at the centre of this, of this plan. And in the Granary Building, the owners of the whole site um, um, built an art school, which you can see behind. Um, and this art school is Central St. Martins, which is a very, very interesting art school where they do uh, fashion design and, 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 and I think they're a very important bit in, in the purposeful sense, very important in, in institution in London. And they were moved to this new building. And this new building has this kind of new contemporary flat architecture where every, every, everything's kind of flush and it's somehow what you're supposed to do in architecture today. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then what they had is they made this, this hall, which is in between the old building and the new building. Yeah? And this is a public hall that's open 24 hours a day. And they didn't know what to do with it. I think they imagined it half as a kind of turbine hall for it, something like, like this. But they really didn't know what to do. So, so the, people had, uh, the people who own and run, run, run the site um, proposed to Richard Wentworth to do something here. Now Richard, uh, we had previously invited Richard to a structure we had uh, built during Art Basel and he gave a talk uh, in one of our structures and he liked it very much. So he invited, he invited us to actually take on this space and come up with something um, to work here. And so we basically went on walks. We went on walks around the site. Um, we saw, as you saw, this kind of, this kind of um, uh, large company architecture. We saw some of this. We saw lots of building sites. We saw lots of strange inventions like this, which are quite beautiful. Um, even, even something like this can be quite, quite beautiful because how this, thing, it's, how this thing is not cut is actually the thing that makes it beautiful. It's kind of wrong, but kind of intriguing. And this whole site is somehow surrounded by or contains either very large building sites or very small building sites. And building sites, um, are quite exciting places for ar ar architects uh, because it's that space limited by uh, time and space where, where something's supposed to happen. So there's a kind of anxiety attached to it. But there's a lot of invention um, in, in, in the building site. Hence, architects since 1970s and even the 60s have been trying to recreate the feeling of the, uh, the building site within finished bits of architecture. Um, 
And so we went around taking photos, and some, some of the photos are, f are from us, some of them are from Richard, and, and found this kind of world occupying this kind of invisible world of construction, occupying this now um, slowly being redeveloped world of, of enormous buildings. Um, for instance, the Guardian is there now, uh, Eurostar is there now, Google's moving there now. There's a series of huge institutions which are going to be in this place. But interspersed amongst this are these little um, uh, constructional moments where people are having to come up with something to make something hap happen. And things like this I find extremely beautiful. These, this was a group of Irish uh, builders um, who, because it's very cold, they built a hut which was off from the ground so your feet don't get cold. Um, and also facing the wind, so, so the building itself breaks the wind. But it's full of beautiful details like this. Like, if you want to stiffen that corner or join the two bits of wood, you just get a bit of ply, cut it diagonally, and, and attach it. So there's an awful lot of invention in and around the site. And these are some photos from Richard. We had this sort of backwards and forwards with, with him about the idea of propping up, carrying, gravity, um, um, the, kind of a the, the normal things of, of architecture, staircases, roofs cheap timber. I said, the, these are very much from Richard. These are things he, I don't know how, how he notices so many of them, but he's sort of endlessly noticing things like this. These are basically stairs, which somehow someone got hold of and turned it into a, a garden wall for a, not a particularly nice garden, but a garden wall. And they've even decided to step it up and down, which I think is quite a beautiful little detail. The, this also, these, these metal things are designed to be on the ground for uh, drainage, but for some reason someone has blocked up their window with it. This, I couldn't figure out what this is for. I guess at some point it must have been for um, propping, uh, propping some, some uh, bracing against it. But it ends up being a kind of beautiful piece in itself, with this extremely aggressive glue. OK, and then, and then there was this idea, this is some, some, some other work we've done, where this idea that you take somehow normal things and just give them um, um, you just re 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 reorganize them ac according to aesthetic lines. So for instance, this, this, this was a market, and we noticed in the market that the, the mushrooms all came in these blues from across the kind of spectrum. So we collected them for a particular project and piled them according to this gra gradient. And we found this quite a useful way of working, whereby you just make an observation to see what's there, you collect it, and then you assemble it according to some aesthetic principle. This is uh, uh, my own photo of, 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 again, a kind of inventive builder. His radio didn't work, so he attached the, the ruler to it. This is another one, the, another one of these builder's tables where he had to make a chop saw table, so it's almost, it looks almost impossibly weak here. This joint is kind of almost nonsense, but the triangles are what makes, makes it possible. So we were looking around all, all this stuff and trying to think, OK, what is this? It's almost a shame that this the art, this, the art school has to move into, in, into this very controlled, flat, contemporary space. How can we bring some of the, po the possibility that that, that that hall could be a place where things are both made and enjoyed? How can work, films, fashion shows, art, how can you how, how, how find a space where things can be made and in, enjoy them? Um, and we started to look at lots of examples of, of temporary arch architecture, historic, and, and otherwise. And then the idea that we eventually settled on and proposed to Ri Richard was to make a kind of Black Maria. Now, the Black Maria is um, Thomas Edison's film studio. It's, I think it's the first film studio ever. Uh, on the left, you see the Black Maria, and on the right, you see the first film made there. It's something like two seconds long. You can see it on YouTube. Um, but what's intriguing about the Black Maria is that it rotates and the roofs open according to what lighting conditions they want. But, so it is quite a special building, but at the same time it's built, built with completely uh, everyday normal uh, construction tech techniques. So it's a strange mix between the completely banal and everyday, but the completely specific, a kind of machine for, for, for making um, uh, films. So we want to do something similar, we want to make a Black Maria but more, fo more focused on the actual appreciation of, of, of work. Um, just to say why that's important, sorry to do this, to give you a, a fit. Here, 
this hall, this is the hall here, and this is a security barrier. Now, my brother's girlfriend is studying here, and the security is so high that he can't go in there to visit her. So it's a, it, for me, it's a kind of education castle. It kind of destroys the point of central St. Martin's. So we began to think, well, this huge space has some potential, so how can we make, how can we make the school come out and the, and the world go in? So that hall actually has some potential to do, do that. Usually it's occupied with not very good exhibitions. Um, I think this stuff is not so relevant for this talk, but we did some, <laughs> we did some models about what this form could be, working very much with um, uh, just what the form needs to be, right? One-to-one uh, -one mock ups. And then, so, so we ended up deciding on this one in the middle, more or less. And the idea being that you make a kind of billboard that faces uh, the hall, uh, and behind the billboards you have just whatever has to go on, which for me reminds me of particular Saul Steinberg drawings, which we're looking, which I, I remember looking at the time even, where you have a facade, a kind of, a kind of symbolic facade, and behind that you just have the stuff uh, that, um, that you need. And this billboard is a kind of uh, performance billboard. Um, Let's go into it. We'll come back to it. And it's composed of very simple things, a very large staircase. So instead of having um, 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 uh, uh, a kind of performance a area, which this is all about, you just have a staircase which you can sit informally on. And the construction is all made from very cheap uh, m material. I think, I can't remember the exact cost of the materials, but it was shockingly low. It was only a couple of thousand just for the materials. And so here we have it. So, so this is this kind of inhabitable billboard that acted as, um, as a performance space inside, but also allowed the outside to be a performance space and also the staircase. And it has, has a lot of ideas of, 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 of the construction site in it. So for instance, the, the, the ply boards are kept full size, so you don't have to cut them so there's less work, which is what you would do as a builder. It has this, this um, triangular detail of the way to hold the boards to, to, together. Then at the back, you just have a collection of objects that do whatever it is you need to do, fire escape, um, wheelchair access. And all those things become special moments in themselves. And the whole thing is designed to be somehow ambiguous. So you can't say you definitely sit here, you definitely do this there, but um, make sort of light su suggestions. So here it is in its sort of everyday use. It also had a screen going up and down. It had these very simple everyday details. The screen was double-sided, so whatever you saw on the inside, or whatever was going on the inside, you saw on, on the outside. The, st the structure was even used for interpretations for contemporary dance. It was used for double-sided talks, which were fantastic, actually, this talk series. Um, so actually, this was quite a good one. Um, it was also used for a fashion show, and St. Martin's is one of the most interesting fashion schools in the world. So to have a St. Martin's fashion show um, on the structure was, was, was quite an honor. And around the edge, because it's St. Martin's, the press around the edge are actually quite um, relevant in, in interesting press. OK, so that was one, one project. And I'm going to show one more, and then we're finished. Um, so this is another Saul Steinberg drawing. The other project I started with Saul Steinberg drawing as well. And it's this idea of the fragment and the imagination um, and how you can occupy something with your body and your mind. Oh, wait. No, this isn't Steinberg. Sempe. This is Sempe, yeah. Oh, I got the wrong one. Yeah, anyway. It's like Steinberg, <laughs> uh, who, I, who, 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 who was in the talk previously, but I cut, I cut him out earlier today. Um, but anyway, so there's this other project where we were invited by the Barbican Museum of London to propose a structure to open a conversation with the public about the history of the site. Um, the Museum of London has a difficult building and they don't quite know what to do with it, uh, but they feel a little bit trapped by it um, on the one hand. Um, but on the other hand, they're in this incredible location, which is the Barbican being one of the cultural hubs of uh, London. So again, we went on a walk around the area and there is, this, is, is basically, uh, you could say, this distinguishing feature, if you look carefully enough, 
is the fact that these huge structures, whether it's the Barbican Centre itself or these finance buildings, um, um, in and amongst them you get these little fragments, these little historical fragments. So there's a, there's a Roman fragment, there's a Tudor fragment, there's a mock Tudor fragment, and there's, uh, there's various of them. And there's this particular fragment, which is a leftover of a Sir Christopher Wren church. Um, it's actually a house now um, in the middle of a traffic island, which is very unusual, but it's rather beautiful. And it used to have a church extending uh, that way uh, to the right. But it's one of these collection of bizarre fragments that begin to make you wonder about the age of the place, the possibilities, where you can go, where you can't go. So we began to imagine this idea that what if there was a structure that linked the entrance of the, or there was once a structure that linked the entrance of the Museum of London to the fragment of the Sir Christopher Wren Church. Sir Christopher Wren has a cathedral very nearby to the south, and this structure is somehow at the scale of the, um, of the Barbican cent Centre. So we began to kind of fabricate this story after this walk and to make the story about a kind of a kind of counterfactual story about the sites. And so we thought, what could this thing left over be, left over thing be? And so, like the Semper drawing, <laughs> good that I noticed though. Uh, <laughs> uh, we began to think about what this thing could be, um, uh, and it had to have a certain scale. These are these these are piers from cathedrals, and piers are collections of columns, they're quite often four by five meters. In Rome you have piers which are ten by fifteen meters. They're, they're, they're the size of buildings, yeah? These ones are all the size of uh, rooms. And we began to look, 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 look at these as kind of intriguing fragments. Um, and again, looking at Rome, at St. Peter's, actually these, these, these fragments somehow on the one hand are monumental, on the one hand are kind of uh, friendly uh, in a weird kind of way. I hesitate before combining those two words, but there we go. And so we were kind of intrigued by this idea that, that if this museum is not sure what to do with itself, it's not sure if it wants to become more monumental, more iconic, or continue how it is now, this kind of slightly hidden 1960s anti-monumental -mo building. We propose them to build a kind of piece that opens the discourse on monumentality itself, and a kind of uh, a monumentality which is somehow broken. So this is the site, it's an extremely complex site, there's lots of levels and layers and there's walkways and there's a park and the entrance of the site is here. And then we begin to think about, well how do we draw this thing, how do we make this thing, how, how do we make this fragment? So we began to go back to the, so we say the very basics of architecture with this nine square which could be used for a house, it could be used for an architectural detail. And we began to think about by looking at examples, we didn't, we didn't copy a p precise example, we just uh, uh, derived a kind of uh, 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 a, a type. We began to imagine what if it was part of a larger structure, and then how would you make this thing? And one of the things that we were interested in is the idea of theatre, um, this idea of something having a back and a front, uh, a finished facade and an facade. So we began to think about this thing as like a, plas a piece of plaster there's a long tradition in architecture of one material being realized in an old material, the most famous being obviously the uh, ancient timber building supposedly realized in stone by the ancient Greeks, uh, but there are many oth other examples such as a uh, scagliola, which is a, uh, um, a, a plaster which is used extensively in, re in Renaissance Italy um, um, to look like stone, and we use scagliola in this particular pro project. But here you see the beginning of the construction, you see this timber frame inside well, we fitted a staircase in, in as well. The reason being is to kind of break the, the kind of authority of, of the uh, both geometrical and interior, but from the outside, break the authority of the, um, of the, mo the, the, the monument. So here's the timber structure. Here's the applied plaster and scagliola base. Here it is under, under assembly as a kind of stage, a kind sort of mini stage set. We produced it in parts and um, had it delivered to site and then er erected it. And here it is. So it's extreme, all, all completely fake looking, strange ob object, which on the one hand invited you to sit down because the height of the base was exactly um, uh, uh, seat, uh, bench height. Um, and 
on the other invited you to find your own little niche to, to sit and be somehow a, have a little moment of, of rest and, and, and uh, privacy in an extremely busy museum entrance. And here we see the interior where, you, where the, whole, the whole fakeness, the whole, the whole kind of art, artifice of, of the game is revealed. And on the right you see someone at the top of the staircase uh, which we feel is very important because what would happen is that you'd see this sort of monumental classical piece, but then suddenly you'd see this head pop popping up, um, which is a kind of uh, a kind of um, point against monumentality because we're not entirely convinced that the museum itself should become um, a kind of icon. So here we are inside again, this kind of this architecture of of, of, fi of film sets and stage sets. And it did all of the things that classical ar architecture does at various scales. You know, it, it, it works with the convex and the concave, the rectilinear and the curvilinear, and catches all the possible variations at any one, po po or any one time of light and shadow. And this gave it a kind of, uh, a kind of game. This, this, actually, this corner here is just finished being reproduced. It's going to be exhibited in the Zurich Kunsthalle from Friday night. So if you want to have an interesting night out on Friday in Zurich, please come and visit. So here you see the scagliola, which is the, um, the darker part. Um, but there's a kind of practical reason to have scagliola, because there's 300,000 people sitting on this thing. So it had to be really strong. But there's also a nice benefit that scagliola is this kind of beautiful, false uh, marble. And this is the kind of everyday scene that you found there, which for me was a, a kind of big success, this kind of commotion of the city finding a place around a, 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 a piece of architecture. And that's it. This is the piece, just to say, which is on Friday. this piece is going to be located in a corner in the gallery. So it will be like this uh, drawing. Um, I wish I had, I would have had a photo for you, but unfortunately we had some problems. But come on Friday and can have a look. Uh, and that's it. Leave it at that. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. It was one hour. It's good. Yeah, perfect timing. Uh, very insightful uh, talk. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, it's very interesting how you stress the line from uh, your observation to the practice. Yeah. Somehow, yeah. I hope it made sense because I, I previously had a, a nicely figured out presentation, but it got destroyed. Yeah. But, so <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you could follow a line. <laughs> well, I, I must say that uh, Nick had uh, his computer was broken just before he left Zurich. No, yeah. All the presentation, so no, yeah. So. Everything. So I hope it. I, I hope there was a line through it at least, you know. It's a good question. Um, it's a good question because I guess what, I, what I'm looking for in work that I like or work that I do, I'm looking for this idea of, um, I know I'm looking for this kind of observation, this kind of stuff. So sometimes I have that thought as well. What is it that I'm not looking for? But I never really get that far with that thought for some reason. I think, I think it's something to do which is completely hem hermetically sealed and not open. Um, both literally, but also um, intellectually. Um. Actually, uh, I can ask you also, uh, how would you uh, see a static, uh, static line? Yeah. A static line? Yeah. Um, well, I, well, the thing is, architecture is static, right? That's the weird thing about it. Uh, it's, it's kind of still. But a static line, well, there's this really interesting book, which is by um, Tim Ingold, which you should have a look, where he's, he's the first person to make a kind of anthropology of the line, or human anthropology of the line. And he talks about this, this uh, movement from 
the I mean, the idea of the line being a drawing or writing. Drawing and writing are essentially the same thing at one point. And then you have print, right? And print radically changes uh, what those lines are. They're fixed. And then he moves into uh, to, me to mechanization and modernism and begins to discuss at length what he views as the problems of what he calls, he even uses the term static line. So I think you find it very in, in, interesting. I, I, I can't entirely agree with him because I have two static lines. I like static lines, you know, like uh, uh, particular architectural drawings. Um, um, but I think it's, I, I think I don't have a particular ans an answer for you um, other than to say, I think you can answer it. I think di directly through technique I couldn't answer it because I, I am interested in, in, in lines which have a kind of static nature. But I think in terms of, uh, of what kind of architecture uh, you might make or, some, or, or is going to be informed by the expanded notion of, of the line, this kind of openness, this ob ob observation. So the, one of the problems I had with the building um, uh, for the art school, which I hope the architect never sees this video, but <laughs> one of one of the problems with it is that it follows all the conventions of contemporary architecture. It's minimal, it's flat, it's enclosed, it's hermetically sealed. It has a series of things which I would say are the opposite to a line. Yeah? Um, it somehow has the characteristics of, like a, of a kind of um, corporate plaza where you have very flat facades and it catches the wind in a particular way. It offers no, no place of comfort or respite uh, in that space. And if you look at other examples, maybe his, his, historic ones, this kind of idea of, of a building having depth and allowing more possibilities to do things uh, which are unplanned, um, to me is more to that idea, this logic of, of the line. Uh, but that's a difficult one to get into. I want to avoid that conversation actually because it becomes so personal at that point, which is why I recommend just looking at Tim Ingold. Yeah. The treatise of Renaissance about painting divide into big families. Uh, lines uh, yeah. and the color inside the lines mm -hmm. and between drawings and painting. Mm -hmm. The difference was drawings, it's something done with lines and paintings and something without lines, with shadows, colors. Yeah. And uh, it's not the exactly say that Leonardo say, but uh, it's a lot about Leonardo and Batista Verde tells that the machine were drawing with the lines and so you can draw, uh, can see a lot of really nice drawing, nice uh, drawing of Leonardo with this machine, mm. but in perspective, but only with lines. And the same one of Francesco Di Giorgio. And what's about your work? Because yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because I there are no colors. I don't like too much. And yeah, yeah, this yeah, yeah. Lines. It's a colorless between. Yeah, I mean, uh, but, that, but, that's, but that, that's why I think what's interesting about Steinberg's work is even though it's not an architectural drawing where you send it to someone and someone builds, it has all the characteristics of being measured. It has all the characteristics of exactitude um, of an architect's drawing. And a kind of architect's drawing for work, at least, is about leaving out texture, leaving out color. Um, and I guess, I guess I personally had I personally had some difficulty with that actually while I was studying and first started working, but then I, I eventually came came to the point where actually, what what can you really do, just with lines? We even investigate. I mean these. I mean here, this this for us was new. It was like using texture. Yeah, it was a new move, <laughs> but we wanted to investigate, in some length, what you can do with lines. Like for instance, the first drawing of this. It's only lines. Wait, where is it? Uh, Sorry. And somebody said the lines are useful. Here, yeah, look. And the texture. Are you can't see it, unfortunately. Nice. <laughs> well, you can't see it, unfortunately. But this, but this drawing, if if it's clear, what's what's incredible about only using lines is that when they have more density and less density, they begin to get pa they begin to get a whole other logic. So we we're very carefully sort of working our way through these basics of architecture, shall we say? This drawing we actually drew. Um, at three by three meters in a museum, and it was extremely beautiful because even though it didn't have um, um, a direct on the wall, so it somehow dealt with light and depth, but only with the natural light. It somehow began to suggest other things uh, beyond just lines. Um, 
And also the, the other thing is these two projects I, I show you, uh, I mean there are other projects for, for houses and things, but I'm showing you these kind of cultural ones here, is they're very much based on what the basic unit of the project is, whether it's a board or a, or a curve. And that already, we begin to work already from the beginning with precise line drawings, with the, ki the, the, the kind of approach you, you would take um, with, a, um, with certainly with certain kinds of classical build building, this kind of rigorous exactitude, which is linked up to not necessarily function in these projects, but to more of a, rit more of a ritualistic um, uh, function. Um, I don't think that answers your question, but kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, one thing I want to say is, what, uh, but I didn't get to touch on because there's a bit of a gap between my slides and my text, unfortunately. Uh, was one thing I like about Steinberg is, even though I'm a, I, I'm a practicing architect, design and build things, there's some things not shown here. There's a previous experience working for architects on things that built. One of the things I like about Steinberg is that he, you, and if you claim him as an architect, it opens up the possibility that architects don't have to build to be architects, because one of the things I find slightly oppressive in architecture, even though I'm deeply interested in construction building things, is that there's an idea that to be an architect, the only thing you can do to be taken seriously or useful is to be a, a builder. But what uh, I think, if, if you're a writer, you can be equally an ar architect. It's just another s discipline that makes up a larger di discipline. If you're just a drawer, you're also a kind of a critical drawer, not, not someone who makes uh, propositions or, or designs, but you, uh, you make a kind of uh, critique on, on society. That's also part of being an architect. So I like the possibility of considering as an architect because it expands the notion uh, or makes the, 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 the culture of architecture actually richer. It's not just I do buildings, it's I work with the world of buildings. Um, that's the one point I forgot. Um, yeah. We see uh, in one quality in the essay phase uh, or uh, the drawings you show from Steinberg uh, that is quite different from the drawings you show mm. in your own work is that they are hand drawings, no? Yeah. So, my question you yep. started the, the kind of the historical overview with the Renaissance and you stated that the Renaissance it started with very organized, very linear. Uh, quite dry. Dr quite dry academic drawings, I think. Yeah. There's a, a whole prehistory uh, before the first, uh, first uh, books are published. Before Alberti. Was, exactly. Yeah. So the Peruzzi and the yeah. Bramante and all these great, uh, oh. Michelangelo, especially all these great guys, they were yeah. very not conventional uh, yeah. way of drawings with a lot of hand drawings, no, yeah. just some the proportions and uh, looking into the drawing. And as you work as a, as a group, I, I ask myself what, uh, what role does the hand drawing play? It, it, also it, it, it plays a big part. I just I couldn't bring myself to actually show hand drawings because yeah. I'm not sure if they I th thought it would be a bit pretentious even. But um, I don't know. Just I, I think I should have given them more space on the page or something. I don't know. No, but um, but what I would argue is the character of of a structure like this, like these ones, comes from model making as well, but very much drawing. So the same with like how Lena's work has a kind of particular character to it. There's a particular um, I world which I think is generated partially from drawing and redrawing things. Um, so, but that's also something I, I wouldn't be, be able to go into here because it would sound a bit esoteric. Uh, but I would argue that embedded in the work there is, there is this approach of redrawing things by hand again and again and again um, and trying to investigate slight changes of angle. I mean, um, I, this, this project, I don't think, I mean, you could have done it purely with 3D modeling and, and, um, and CAD, but I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think that's the character. Like the word, the, 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 the architecture behind is very much the product of, of, uh, of uh, 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 static lines, uh, 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 not, not really working with hand drawings. I mean, you know for a fact that the, the only hand drawing that probably existed of this drawing was like a large scale one with a big yellow arrow going through in a heart and saying, proving how it functions, you know. Uh, that I imagine is the only hand drawing that was produced for this project. Um, whereas these smaller cultural projects, I actually a lot about, but maybe you're right, maybe I should have showed a, a, a series of them the next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I write this down. <laughs> yeah, it's very important, it's very important. I, 
I was going to see if I have any here, but I won't. I won't show. Did you say that uh, the, so the computer drawing is more static than hand drawing? Potentially, yeah. Because uh, it's very difficult to compose a drawing on a on a computer. I mean, you can you can compose by hand, yeah. but and you can do the detail by computer. But but that's but that's also I wanted to expand the notion of line also in Steinberg's work, is I imagine he goes on walks, I imagine he, make, he does make observations. So the line is not, what's great about Steinberg's work is it's not just literally line, it's the whole practice he brings is line-like somehow, story-like, you know. So, so I wanted to focus here more on those other aspects um, rather than the hand drawing. But the hand drawing is extremely important. Maybe the sketchbooks. The linear and non-linear, which, well, the computer is yeah. non-linear yeah. compared to analog. Yeah. And, uh, it's, um, uh, you, you make this comparison between handwriting and typewriting. So yeah. You separate everything. Yeah. Do you see the difference between when you draw on the computer, which becomes maybe the result is more flat, or because it's uh, non-linear? Yeah, it is. I think, uh, uh, what, well, the big problem is, I don't know if I don't know if this is a famous story or not, but in in, in EMTB, the, the office in um, Barcelona, it's EMTB in Rick and um, EMTB who are I think a great architects. So I don't like the work always, but I respect it. But one that apparently one of the stories in the office, this does answer the question, believe it or not. One of the stories in the office is that when they first began to get CAD, and this is an office that really drew, they drew like constructed curves and bigger curves, everything's hand drawn. When they first start using CADs. Uh, the bosses, the two partner ar ar architects, insisted that the people using computers don't zoom in and out. They only pan. They only pan, so you're drawing at a scale. I think one of the problems of, of, uh, of uh, drawing the computer is this lack of scale. Like, you're not, you're not drawing for a particular, for a particular output. You're, 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 not, you're, you're not drawing for a particular drawing, um, whereas if you're actually literally doing it, then, then you begin to um, have a much more yeah, a much more direct relationship with the output of what, what you're doing. You, you can think in a compositional way. You're not stuck in this kind of yeah. uh, data, kind of adding data, removing data. Um, yeah. Mm. And actually, this time is when you're getting entangled with the work, and this is maybe heading in a specific direction. Uh, I'd be happy to do it, but I'm not sure it's the forum. Maybe it's more for a drink afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but this is an interesting point to me because if you draw it in, uh, yeah, you're drawing this line, and you're thinking, oh, it's this material, it's handled by these people, mm. it comes from there, and then you're anticipating the end point and what that detail will be, what other material it's being after, et cetera. Whereas if you draw the same line in CAD, it's just two endpoints. Mm -hmm. There's no this, this temporal entanglement simply can't happen. And there's also no, there's no mistakes or errors. And one of the really important things about uh, working is that if you're making a, a project or doing whatever it is, it's never linear. It's never like it always gets better, 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 and then we've finished. Actually, along the way, you have to sort of relook at your work in another way. You have to embrace errors. You have to embrace kind of things that you don't plan. And even um, yeah. But, no, but, but, this, but this is why in, in, in the 90s, why I can understand why the first people in, in interested in uh, CAD software as ways to uh, generate architecture were interested in animation and things evolving out of control. It makes perfect sense because <laughs> you don't want to know completely what the result is going to be. Just say, I do, I do find um, the, the computer a very useful tool. I like it a lot, but I try to use it in a completely restrained way. Um, so just as a, as a question, do you know the time frame in which these elevated horizon drawings were done by Steinberg? Because I suspect he might have picked it up from Jean Dupuyé, who was doing a lot of these. For him, this was a really uh, consistent uh, method from the 40s onwards. You know, he started quite early. Um, he started quite early. I mean, I, again, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a Steinberg scholar, but certainly when he was making illustrations privately in Milan, he was already putting this horizon right at the top. Um, and I mean, he may, I can't remember where I read it. Maybe he mentions it in the, autobi on the autobiography. But if you go and 
find that you it starts earlier than because you, because when you think of that you think of the New Yorker you think of the New Yorker cover you think of it coming l later but actually it comes much earlier. Um, I'm trying to remember his work. Sorry, I, tr I can't remember the work. What's? Can you draw it? Absolutely, sure. Uh, what's it look like? It's commercial. I mean, w one. W when he was doing this, he had a, he would use a uh, rather thick bag paper and the pen that would bleed. So if you slow down, the line would get thicker. Ah, I think I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that stuff. Yeah, yeah. He was doing these kinds of things. Yeah, for many different WPA projects. Yeah, yeah. What if, do you think there's a connection? I suspect there might be, but I don't know. I mean, I know that uh, there's a lot of cross influence. I guess for me it sounds like the, the, the pen or the line as an action, it kind of, along the way there are stops, you know. There are stops that, that, um, that happen. Now one, one thing, just I wanted, another thing I wanted to, uh, that I actually cut out was actually that Steinberg wants to be considered an artist, but I'm going to claim him for architecture. But what's in interesting is he starts as a commercial artist, a bit like Andy Warhol. And I, even though he's 15 years old or 20 years old or something, something like this, I find strange parallels between his work and pop art. It is, it is, it is kind of like a... It, there's a the weird link that I think is not investigated, I think, but anyway. Yeah? Well, I, I don't know like, if you see the, the, the like, Sid Only or Steinberg use like, the line to tell a story. Use more like the line for like delimited like a space or like use also the line for like to tell the story to tell something like this. Mm, 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 mm. I can't remember the work either. Sorry, my. Yeah, well, Sidonbly, the two. Oh, Sai Twombly. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's that. That's also an amazing work. Um, there's there's a whole other show you should do actually. Yeah, from, from <laughs> this is the start of the new project. Yeah. <laughs> Lines two. Uh, yeah, thank you again very thank much. You, yeah. And I think we can